Well, we made it. We are in Southport, North Carolina. We had a, an adventurous trip. Neil, how many miles did we go? 420 miles. 420 miles, and probably most of 400 of that was offshore. I, that was the offshore portion. Of yeah, yeah, but there's the, the dock to dock. I didn't count the hours. It was three nights and a good part of four days. Yeah, I didn't either. It was, what, it was what, almost four. What time, what time we did we depart? 10 o'clock in the morning. Morning, in the morning. And we landed at about 8 o'clock in the morning on Thursday. So Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. We, we were thinking we would do it about... But half a day, and day later, a day gonna be shorter. At, we're going to be in between noon and four the day before. We got too far out offshore. We were what, 100, and, 100, 100 plus 100. miles offshore. We got outside of the Gulf Stream. One of the, there's so many features on this, and I'd like to compliment Clayton and Deanna, who had the boat before when she was Tivoli. And we should have you talk about the name of the boat now, too, in a second. But the one thing that we don't have is a water temperature sensor. And when you're going to be riding the Gulf Stream, that's one way of kind of helping to verify because we got into deep enough water that our depth was not reading. And so we, we learned out there. But we, we got, we're getting beat up. We had to throttle back and run at about five knots. It's very discouraging when you're keeping a trip log and you note that you made five miles forward <laughs> progress in one hour when, when you were anticipating maybe making eight or nine with the Gulf Stream mm -hmm. pushing you. So tell, tell me about the name of the boat. Okay, the name of the boat is Granuel, which is the Gaelic pronunciation of Grace O'Malley. Grace O'Malley was a 15th century Irish pirate queen, and I am one of her descendants. I've been sailing with a pirate all this time. Yes. R. R. Yeah, yeah. No, it, it's a cool name. It's a unique name. One thing that was kind of a bit off is the AIS tracking us was not available on all the different channels that you can follow that. I like to check in with my wife, Pam, offshore, and Neil and Kathleen have a Garmin in reach, which I was able to text her and let her know is okay. So that's a good feature. But we have all the electronics. We have all the all the gear you really need to go offshore, which, which they've inherited and improved on. We did our pilot house watches. We worked on a check sheet for that on a clipboard, and we also had one in the engine room to make sure we were monitoring everything. Uh, we were doing an engine room check as you came on watch at night. During the day, we did it more closely to on the hour. Mm -hmm. But... We now have some pretty good values to summarize. So when you use the infrared temperature gun and you shoot a spot, you can have a pretty good range instead of having to record it all the time. And we talked about what you need to do kind of on a fast engine room check if it's really rough versus doing the full thorough tour. And we've also talked a little bit about the flow to maybe make it easier and smoother for next time. Maybe have three or four places to sit in the engine room to get the values you want. And and then in the pilot house, the, the flow was we we're going jumping around a little bit to get things. We're just going to talk about fine tuning, but you don't know until you get out there. We we have the data now, and we had a good report. Neil, what was your favorite part of the trip? You know, I think experiencing the rough conditions. Just I wouldn't want to do it again necessarily, <laughs> plan it that way. Yeah. But to to exercise this this vessel, to exercise, uh, see how well we could handle it uh, with with you on board. Yeah, well, it's comforting to have somebody who's done something like this before. Uh, and that was the whole idea. When we, when you guys purchased the boat mm -hmm. uh, six months ago, we had blocked this week off. And, right, right. Uh, I'm uh, prone to say that the most dangerous thing you can have on a boat is a schedule. Mm -hmm. But the weather looked good enough. It wasn't as friendly out there as we thought. Right. The wind never really got much over 20 knots. No, but, but the sea was lumpy. And yeah. the only thing you can really do is adjust your course or go a little bit slower, which we had to do both. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. What about... Your first time at the helm at night. What were you thinking? I was scared. I mean, I was nervous leading up to it. I won't say I was scared. I just didn't quite know what it'd be like to steer in darkness. 
and just go totally on instruments like a, a pilot trust, flying an airplane. Trust them, right? Trust them and trust me to know to catch everything. We do have a lot of very good instrumentation that makes me feel more comfortable. Yeah, there's 30 or so things in the pilot house that we're monitoring. Yeah, yeah, and, all the and, time and then recording every hour. And I, especially having both the near and long distance radars, was very helpful. Yeah, two radars. And having our our clotter there was a good thing. It it all having it all available made me feel a lot more secure. And I had other people tell me often, you won't even notice it. You'll just get used to looking at the radar, and it won't be a big deal. And that, I agree with that. It, but when you're looking forward at nighttime, you're not seeing the waves. So that last well, last hour or two of twilight, you kind of have to get the speed right and yeah. and the angle. Yeah, you know, because you don't want to go clunking, clunking. I did not spend one night up in the forward cabin, uh, which was my deal. I actually was up there at one point using the toilet. It's just sanitary and safer to sit down on the toilet. I went flying. I was a flapjack up there one time. and uh, But that's part of it. We do have two heads on the boat. They're both forward. You have to go down the stairs, which can be a little bit dicey at night. There's a safety leash across the rails there to keep you from falling down. But we just left it on most of the time and just limboed underneath it. Uh, and we found when it was really rough, of course, it was much safer to sleep further out. The VIP stateroom on this boat is the starboard settee. Uh, and and I, mean, I slept on the floor one night. Mm -hmm. Fine. I mean, you're tired. You want, I mean, you need to get that sleep so you're ready. Right. Once it settled down, it was nice to sleep in the stateroom. We did have one uh, incident where we lost the air conditioning and uh, Neil was brave enough to volunteer to go back to the lazarette and reprime the pump. Right which fortunately is something he had learned before he done. I mean, you really know, need to know how to bleed the engine if you lost fuel, which was mm -hmm. never an issue for us. Neil was responsible for our fuel selection, and he did a great job because we came back into the dock and were very level, so we consumed about the same amount of fuel on both I sides. I stared at those valves for a while before I turned. <laughs> yeah, <that's>, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't want to get this wrong. Here. Yeah, yeah. The supply and the return yeah. and which side. So, no, well done because we're, we're nice and level now. What was interesting for you about engine room checks? Again, the engine room is loud and hot, and in the tossing seas, I was a bit concerned about hurting myself. Yeah, a lot of hot stuff mm -hmm. in there. Moving yeah, parts. I want to get. It. But I think what I love about this boat, and one of the biggest selling points in this boat, was the very large engine room. Right. Yeah. And um, so for me, Neil had had me run through the checklist several times before we got underway, so that I was relatively comfortable with where the stuff was. So I was going to be checking. And I think I got quicker at it as we went along because, like, the first time it took like a half an hour in an engine room check. Yeah. I got down to maybe 10 minutes or so. Um, just understanding. You kind of learn where you need to sit and how you need to hold the gun, yep. and where you need to position yourself in recording. So we have all these values now, which we can now summarize so that when you shoot position number 17, you know it's between 170 and 180 mm -hmm. is normal. And you can just shoot it. We'll put 170 to 180 there. And if it's, if it's you know, below that, you're probably fine. If it's over that, something may have changed. But uh, part of this trip was to gain the confidence of going offshore and also gather that information both in the engine room and in the pilot house. We did plot on the paper chart mm -hmm. as well, so we <laughs> lost things. Um, and we did have a turnaround at one point. The, uh, the crane sticks out over the starboard rail, and the lines that were securing them were not taut. They kind of loosened up, and we just didn't want that thing flopping around, possibly um, damaging it. So we did have to retreat at one point, turn back, give up some hard-fought ground, and Neil and I communicated. Uh, he put the safety harness on, went out there. I was out the door, uh, sticking my head out the door on the, on the uh, starboard side, talking to him. But I, we didn't discuss the maneuver before he went out there, and so we lost a little more ground with that. But now he knows how to do a trucker's hitch, and I was able to show him how to do it using an iPhone cord. Which... Learn, <laughs> learning how to tie a new knot under duress. Under duress, yes, yes. So the air conditioning and the crane were probably the two biggest adventures. We ate well, but we didn't eat a lot. Right, right. You've had some I think that's probably food. something we learned to maybe prepare food in advance to a degree of actually making a sandwich as opposed to trying yeah. to make a sandwich while the seas are so heavy. Yeah, well, you Little got... things like that were just so difficult. Uh, when, you, when you're at the dock, you don't notice things, but having it like you do everything in baskets so you can pull a basket out. Because when you open up that refrigerator door, the bow goes up, everything's in your lap or on you, and then, then you got clean up. And yeah, yeah so. I was uh, granted the forward VIP stateroom, which was not a very comfortable place to sleep, but uh, you learn how to adjust on those things. You just have to take your time, mm -hmm. and you don't want to be carrying a lot of stuff. One hand for you and one hand for the boat, yeah, really. Yeah, it's yeah, just yeah, to yeah, kind of... And having drinks, if we don't want a good place to put anything 
down that wasn't going to go flying. Yeah. So that's not a good product. So we've reviewed some of the things we learned, some of the things that they could do differently to improve the next trip. And that's part of this whole cruising experience. Yeah. And But we needed to get out of Florida. What was your deadline for insurance to get north? I believe it was uh, July 1st. Okay, so... so we had two, kind of two weeks. Yeah, and we're, so we're 10 days ahead of schedule, and, you know, the weather was cooperating enough. That you look at the wind, you look at the sea state, and you look at the period, and it didn't look that bad, but once you're out there in the yeah. slop, mm -hmm. it was it was worse, bouncy. Worse than that. Yeah. It yeah. also was not organized. We were side to side and up and down. Yeah. And, you know. yeah. Stabilizers were huge. Mm -hmm. you got to have the stabilizers, and that was part of the check to make sure that those... The reservoir was right, and that the the, the the fin lockers were inspected. There's a flashlight down there, infrared temperature gun. Plans for the summer. Now you're here. What uh, what are you guys going to do? Cruise the Chesapeake. We'll be heading up from Southport to uh, Portsmouth, uh, Virginia. Yeah. Hang there for a few weeks, and then start moving north to the Chesapeake. Good. And then probably until uh, oh yeah, October time frame, and it start coming down. Maybe hang out in North Carolina, South Carolina for a little bit, and then down to Florida. It's kind of nice to really not have a, a defined schedule, right. just more of a general area yep. to go cruising. Well, thanks, you guys, for inviting me along. It was really fun. It's been fun the whole process of, you know, talking over the couple of years to find the right boat and buying the boat and then get into Here we are. Guys. Well, and when I came on, this is part of the thing is when I sell a boat, I like to do this. It's hard to schedule every time. We try to offer that, but timing for everybody is difficult. And this uh, is, is the first trip that I've got on a plane since the uh, COVID pandemic hit. Train, the plane travel was not a lot of fun, but it was really fun being out here with you guys. And I think a lot of the people in the marinas are, you know, mindful of that. We're just not, you guys aren't going to be interacting as much with right. people in the community. And you've got your own social distancing mm -hmm. vessel here to go out cruising with. So right. Right. Uh, anything either you guys want to add to this? No, just it, uh, a lot less. I, like, I'm glad we've done it. And I feel a lot more comfortable with the thought of doing overnights now. Yeah. I don't know if I want to do you know, multiple weeks of it, but um, I, I now know we can't do it. Right. And I agree. It's with coastal you. cruising, right? It's much more comfortable going offshore. Yeah. You'll be, I mean, I, and again, I would say it's, it's, it's easier at night for a couple of reasons. There's less traffic out there and, but you have to, to know what everything is and know how to trust it and where to, how to operate it. The ICW, when you're having to stay within channel markers and there's a lot more traffic mm -hmm. is actually harder. Yeah, I think it's, it's a different stress level, but it's yeah. almost more significant than yeah, you make sure miss one buoy, and all of a sudden you're in the muck. All right. Yeah, and I would also add that scopolamine patches or some type of anti seasick med medicine is hugely important. Yeah, and you guys had just the right amount, and that was that was well done. I've been fortunate, having been on boats most of my life, that I've gotten seasick before, but I didn't do a patch, and uh, you know it, it affects people differently. But you guys, it worked great for you guys because yeah, you got your sleep cool. and you were active and alert when you needed to be. Mm -hmm. So, well, this is exciting. So this is the beginning now that they bought the boat, set it up, and, and got it up north. They get to go play. So I look forward to hearing about your adventures. You guys are working on a blog, too, aren't you? Yes, we do. What, tell us about what the blog is so we can follow uh, that. It's mvgranulacruising.blog. Okay. Yes, and it's, uh, when we, uh, so far, I haven't been doing, like, a daily thing. I usually go out, and I just, we both. So hopefully we'll start filling up yeah. the details. Where we travel anywhere, what it's like, what, what we've done on the boat so far. Put in some pictures and video. And, and a link to the uh, Garmin in reach so you can see where we're, where we've been. Well, no, that, that's fun. That's great. You'll have a lot of followers, people watching you. It's yeah. fun. Yeah. yeah, no, I think that's fun. It, it, people out there who are thinking about buying a boat. It's just what you guys did. You, yeah. you went to the Trawler Fest, you talked to people, you read blogs, mm -hmm. looked at YouTube videos. There's a lot of information out there to, to learn about this before you have to write the big check. You could also say do it. we took a big step because we completely sold everything that we have on the land. So we don't even own a car, and this was our first boat ever. We never owned a boat prior to this. So either, you know, fools rush in where angels appear to tread or... <laughs> or whatever, but it's been a good, you can do it. You can make this happen without a whole lot of experience. Yeah, it's uh, with the right help. Yes. The key. Well, I knew with Bernie Francis, we should give kudos to Bernie, which I think we've mentioned before, did some training with mm -hmm. you guys. Yeah. We had Steve Antonio on the survey team to mm -hmm. make sure the boat was right. Uh, we have a lot of checklists that JMYS has provided to you. Mm -hmm. Yes. Including gear. Yes. It's swag. Swag. Yeah, yeah. It's not worth buying a boat just to get a free hat. Right? <laughs> uh, well, actually, the, the, the hat was how much you pay for the boat, and everything else was free. So, 
So yeah. great. Well, it's been a lot of fun. Yes. Thank you. I look forward to coming back. Maybe I can bring Pam back. Yes. We'll go to Bahamas, man. Maybe. Yeah, yeah. She's been told that twice before, and we, yeah. the weather was not a believer. Huh? Yeah, well, Pam, if we can make it work, we will. So, well, thanks, everybody. Thanks for watching. Neil and Kathleen, all Thank the you. success to you guys, and Thank keep you. in touch. I'm just a phone call away. Yes. If I see you calling, I will answer you. <laughs> I know. All right, good. All right. See you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Hey, great to be underway again out on the water. Love it out here. Thank you very much for watching the video. We have a couple of things you can do. One thing is you can click the bell to get a reminder when we post the next video. We love it when you give us those thumbs up. And then you can subscribe by clicking the button below. Once you've seen a couple of videos, you might also want to check out some of the other ones. So you can click on one of these videos on the side. Thanks. We hope to have you come back here soon and we'll be putting up more content shortly.